Anybody else? <laughs> Would you stand with us and sing this morning? And y'all, I'm just going to go ahead and explain. Excuse me if I look wobbly. I have another ulcer, so I'm having to walk on this heel with this leg, and I'm just not good at it yet. So if you see me wobble, that's why. What a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning Whoops, sorry, now we go Leaning Oh, how sweet to walk in this Way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. This is just the words. I don't know what happened. That's all right. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path grows from great today Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting It doesn't matter what happens with the music. If we can lean on Christ, we've got it. And like Betty said last week, we don't praise Him enough. We could start writing it down and never finish. More than 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never Worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His whole.
Blessed in 
this morning we just want to say we love you thank you for the rain thank you for those that were able to attend today father i pray for those that are listening online father it's been a wonderful couple of weeks a lot of sadness but a lot of joy and father we come to you today as broken people and we ask that you speak to our hearts that you mend us, that you guide us during the invitation to come and lay everything at the altar because, Lord, as long as there's something between us and you, we can't have that joy and that peace. So I pray, Lord, that including myself, anyone that needs to just come and have a word with you would do that today. We pray for Pastor Bruce as he brings the message you've given him, that you would hide him and make yourself known. We love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are in the Gospel of Luke. We are walking through the Gospel of Luke. It's a great uh, Christmas present to you because we're still in the beginning chapters of the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to continue to um, look at what we started last week regarding uh, when God shows up uh, to a young female with some pretty big uh, news. Um, and so open your Bible to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And last week we just slowed down and we just meditated upon God speaking to Mary. And we're going to continue to look at that, but... We're going to take the view now for Mary and and take it somewhere else. Uh, Beginning in verse 31. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is a sixth month for her who is called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a privilege it is to call you Father. And it's my prayer that every person in this room, every person listening, will truly be able to call you Father. 
not just with their minds, but truly because you live within their lives, because their lives have been transformed by the gospel, because they have turned away from their sins and they've placed their faith and trust in Christ alone. Jesus, the God who saves, and that is the only hope for this world. That is the only hope for a world that is broken. And Father, whenever we try to put our hope in the wrong things, we're going to be disappointed. Because the only one that can bring contentment, the only one that can bring true worship out of our lives is Jesus. And Jesus, you want abandonment. You want surrender. You want us all to say, as Mary said, oh, I'm just your slave. Do your will in my life. Because when you get to that point in your life, you realize that, God, we can trust you. God, you're faithful. God, you're the sovereign one in the universe who yet humbled himself and came down and took on flesh. And I pray that would resonate in our hearts here today. Oh, Father, we have so much to be thankful for. And if we just use that for ourselves, then it's going to be wasted. But you want us to magnify your name. You want us to shout it from the rooftops who you are. So I pray that you would do that in our lives today. That we just fall more in love with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want us to just reflect on where we are in the story. I mean, put yourself there in the beginning where the promise of the Messiah has been going on and on and on for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God shows up. God shows up in a, an insignificant town to two insignificant people speaking truth that will change the world forever and ever and ever. We saw last week the fulfillment of 700-year-old prophecy from Isaiah 714. And therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel, which we know means God with us. And we see that prophecy being fulfilled when the angel came down and announced to Mary that, hey, you're going you're gonna to be the one. And, of course, she had no idea that that meant that, you know, that this virgin having a child meant that it would be without knowing a man, right? We just assumed that the prophecy meant that this girl at a young age, this virgin would get married and have a baby, but yet, no, it's bigger than that. It's a lot bigger than that. And we, we saw last week that the only place that you see in the Bible where it talks about God's favor being upon Mary, when it says you have found favor with God in verse 30 of Luke chapter 1, we, the only place we see that is in Ephesians 1, 6, remember? Where Scripture says, to the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us with in the beloved in Jesus. And to know Jesus is to know God's favor. And I would say that you can't keep that to yourself. And so it all, it all comes down to this question. This is a question for us today. Is it really possible that a Messiah and the Son of God, which is the same person, but yet representing two different facts, he is Messiah and he's also the Son of God, is it really possible that Messiah and the Son of God will, in Mary's womb, unite in the incarnation of Jesus? Is it really possible? Is it, can we wrap our minds around the fact that God is going to be in a virgin womb and he is going to put flesh upon himself? That's called the incarnation, right? Where when the baby is born, the incarnation that God has put on flesh. Is, 
is this really possible? Is this miracle really possible? And the answer is yes. It is a historical fact that Jesus lived, that Jesus lived a sinless life, that he did miracles, that he rose the dead, that he cast out demons, that he was crucified on a cross, was buried, rose three days later, appeared to witnesses for 40 days, and ascended back to the Father. All that is historical fact. But it's, it takes a lot more facts. It takes more than facts to have faith. Only God can give you faith. That's why I don't have to worry about trying to argue or debate somebody into the kingdom of God. I don't save anybody. I don't convince anybody. It's a supernatural work of God to take what is dead and bring it to life. But woe is me as a Christian if I don't, if I don't live a life compelled and surrendered to do that very thing. Because that's the point. As I heard one pastor say yesterday, my calling in my life is not a pastor. My calling in my life after salvation is to make disciples of all nations, to be a gospel proclaimer. We're all called to proclaim the gospel with our words and with our life. And that's what was so encouraging last week as we gathered together when and Betty gave her testimony, right? It's a, here's, a, here's proof, right, that the gospel is real, that this is a testimony of someone's changed life. And she's burdened for others to come to know Christ and, and from all walks of life come together. Well, let's look at how it all begins. It begins with Jesus. That's her first point. Beginning in verse 31, it begins with Jesus. And again, this name, Jesus, was popular back then. It, it's a name Joshua. goes back to the Old Testament during those times. But this Jesus is different. This Jesus, meaning the name of God who saves, this Jesus will be different. He won't be like another Joshua down the street. He's going to be different. Well, how do we know that he's going to be different? Well, for number one, he, we know he's going to be different because of the way that he is a, he's brought into the world, how he's announced. God himself comes down, sends an angel, right? God sends an angel to speak for the very words of God. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus And we notice several things about this Jesus. He's going to be different. We know that, verse 32, he will be great. He will be great. Then you say, well, uh, wasn't John the Baptist also great? Well, no, John the Baptist was great because he had a qualifier. Jesus is just, just great. John one, uh, Luke 1.15 says that... Uh, that John the Baptist was great before the Lord. Jesus is just great. There's no qualifier. He's just, he's just great. He's different. John was a, a godly man. He was, he was different. He was anointed, but he is not like Jesus. He is just a forerunner. This Jesus is different. He's great. We see in the Old Testament that that word for this Word for great, it is only referred to God, no one else. We also saw that as we walked through Micah 5, 4, it says, He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh his God. They will live securely, for, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. Who is this individual? It's Jesus. This prophecy is coming true. It's Jesus. He will stand. He will shepherd in the strength of God Almighty. He is great. He's also son of the Most High. Uh, that word means supreme and majesty. 
He's not like a God made in the image of man. He is son of the Most High. It's another way of saying son of God. He also has a throne. Look what it says there in verse 32. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now we see the prophecy. Now we, we, we see the prophecy, the Old Testament, coming to fruition. Yes, we know about this. We, the Bible tells us that this person will come through the lineage of David and that he will take up the throne of David. We, we know in Old Testament it promises from 2 Samuel 7, from maybe you're more familiar with uh, Isaiah 9, 6, where it says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. You know how sick we are as, as human beings? Is when we start making political figures uh, equal to Jesus. I mean, didn't we see some of that? Some crazy teachings and thoughts that we saw where you're almost making like political figures like Jesus. It's absurd, but it's nothing new. But Jesus will be known, and it, it, it won't be any question, is this the Messiah? He'll also have an eternal reign, verse 33. This Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob forever, not just for 100 years or 200 years. How long will America continue to exist? I don't know. Not forever. Maybe not even 10 more years. I don't know. God knows. He's in control. I'm optimistic. God can do the impossible. But I know this Jesus... This house of Jacob will be forever and ever and ever. This is bigger than just the nation of Israel. We see this promises coming from 2 Samuel 7. We also see it again in Micah 4, 7. I will make the lame into a remnant, those far removed into a strong nation. Then the Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from this time on and forever. So we see prophecy being fulfilled back in the days of Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men. But we still see, we as a church are hoping, right? We're, we're knowing that this day is coming. We, we start on, the, on a Christian calendar, not all calendars, but today is the start of Advent, right? What does Advent mean? It's Latin for Adventus, the coming. Every Christmas is an opportunity for Christians to say, okay, Jesus, this is about Jesus, the coming of Jesus, right? But we don't, we don't stop in the manger. We keep going to Easter. He's risen from the dead. We don't stop there either, do we? He's coming back. <laughs> He's coming back. So when you have to do funerals at Thanksgiving or, you know, after Thanksgiving, which we have had been affected by in this church, and we have one coming up that we'll be a part of, uh, this week in this church, you're going to have death in, in times of celebration. But listen, we don't put our hope in a perfect turkey and everybody getting along at Thanksgiving. We put our hope in Jesus, the God who saves. We, we had Thanksgiving right, and we all had different surroundings and people, and we had different burdens and we had some great fellowship and we had some heavy prayers right i want you to know my jesus the god who saves i want you to be transformed by him like i am in the process of being transformed by him i want to be like him to reach out to the lowly i want to be like him to show people this jesus the one who who lives right now and who's coming back for his church. This kingdom, this reign is not only uh, eternal, but it is a kingdom with no end. See, whose kingdom are we living for? I promise you, if you're living for your kingdom, you are going to be highly disappointed. We all, you know, sometimes I encourage you to read biographies of people's lives. And we look at people's lives, you know, just listening to the biography or just a testimony, basically, of, 
of Gracia and Martin uh, Burnham, the couple that was uh, captured in the uh, jungles and taken out to the jungles of Indonesia, I believe, lived a year there. And Martin was a man of great faith. Even in the midst of just the darkest times of being in the jungle without food and water and just being in the horrible circumstances, but yet knowing Jesus. And having the hope of being rescued and then having the rescue not happening. And the day before he died, right, he's like, you know what? We're just going to serve the Lord with gladness. <laughs> like, to what, dude? You, you, you're going to serve the Lord with gladness. You're going to serve. You're going to serve a God who put you in this mess. I thought you were a child of the King. Yeah, we are a child of the King, and I don't understand everything that's going on, but I know that He's faithful, and I know that He's done some amazing things in His captivity, and I know because I have the Holy Spirit within me, I can serve the Lord with gladness. And when you surrender to that, God empowers you to live it. And Martin would find himself dead on the next day during the rescue. His wife survived, but he didn't. It's like, man, that's horrible. He spent a whole year in, in captivity, and then he doesn't even get to enjoy the rescue. Oh, yeah, he was rescued. Man, he was in the presence of Jesus. He thought, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. I'm finally, I'm in your presence. The, the battle is over, right? The king, I'm with the king. And I get to enjoy this place of the kingdom with no end. Again, we see the prophecy of nine of Isaiah 9, 7. The dominion will be vast, and his, its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And again, we see it all the way back in Daniel 7, 14. He was given authority to rule and glory in a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Do you believe it? Are we living as if that kingdom exists and will never be depleted, that will be here forever and ever? Are we living for our kingdom? For our things, our philosophy, uh, you know, our desires, our feelings. I mean, what and who are we living for? And to know Jesus, and not only to know Jesus, but to walk with Jesus, because if you're not walking with Jesus, you're not, you don't have the power and the know-how. You just don't. I mean, again, we're too weak and we're too frail. We're too easily distracted. It takes walking with God daily to be reminded it takes a godly man in the jungle to be reminded, you know, that, hey, God's here. <laughs> we can serve the Lord with gladness even in this situation because he is sovereign over the situation. If he didn't want us to be here, we wouldn't be here. And we've given this opportunity to shine forth Jesus. And secondly, we see the Holy Spirit here in the text. Verse 34, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? Mary is like, you know, I, 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 am, I haven't been intimate with a man, so how can this be? That's a good question. It's a good question. The angel replied to her, this is God's word. The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What in the world does that mean? How can you get, be pregnant without having a, another person, another, it takes a man and a woman, regardless of what the world says about pregnancy and having babies and all that, it, it takes a man and a woman. And don't, like I said last week, it's, it's not going to get too weird before God comes down and just like Tower of Babel. You know, how is this possible? Because this is the way things work. I mean, what does it mean? that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. What does this mean? 
Well, most high is not somebody different than the Holy Spirit. It's synonymous with the Holy Spirit. In fact, again, we can't wrap our minds around it, but I'm going to attempt to at least explain a little bit about what's going on here because if you could, if you could put it in a neat little box, it wouldn't be God. It would be some man-made religion that doesn't work very well, that has all kinds of holes and, and just it falls apart because it's of man. But here it means that Jesus and the Father has existed for all eternity. There is no mother in heaven that gave birth to Jesus, right? We all know that because that's what Scripture says. There is no mother. It's God the Father so loved the world he gave his only begotten Son. The Father and the Son have been existed for all eternity. The Father begot the Son from all eternity. Wrap your mind around that one. But the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have existed for all eternity in this perfect relationship. They didn't need to create humans in order to feel loved, right? And it's still the mystery is, God, why did you create us? And we're going to spend all eternity in heaven. It's like, God, I can't believe this. You're like, you know, you didn't need us, but yet you, you created us to worship you and to make you known. And this is just, this, this reality of heaven, a relationship with you is, is mind-boggling. But if it doesn't boggle your mind on earth, then something is wrong because if you know Jesus as your Savior, you have God in you. We're not, become, we're not going to become gods, as the Mormons teach. We, God lives within us, and then when we die, we go to be with Jesus, and then one day our body is going to rise from the dead, and our spirits will be reunited in this resurrected body. But God... The person Jesus, who is God, has existed with the Father, who is God, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. But yet, for God, Jesus, to come down, it had to be something different, right? He had to take on flesh. So how is that possible? Well, I don't know, but I know that the Holy Spirit had a part in it because it tells us here. Mary says, how is this possible? Well, let me tell you how it's possible. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So somehow, some way, the the Holy Spirit is involved with Jesus taking on flesh. This Holy One, that word Holy One, uh, look what it says. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One... To be born will be called the Son of God. The, the holiness represents, the Holy One represents somehow the working of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in the life of Jesus. He, listen, he, is, he has flesh. It does, it's not just pretending. This is what some false religions taught in the very beginning. Jesus is not just pretending to be God, right? He's not a ghost where he just pretends to have flesh. He, no, he has flesh, so he is able to be tempted. We see that in the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's able to be tempted just like we are, yet without what? Sin. Praise God, there's finally somebody who is not going to fail, right? Even on my best day, I'm still going to sin. Praise God, there's going to be somebody like that, and his name is Jesus. And Paul brings this out in Romans. Listen to this. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, prophecy being fulfilled, verse 4 of Romans 1, and who has been declared to be the powerful son of God by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Again, we see the working of the Holy Spirit with the resurrection. So we see in the life of Jesus, you see that the working of the power of Jesus is always connected to the Holy Spirit. And this one, this Jesus, also is called the Son of God. He's not going to become the Son of God as he learns, as he develops. No, he is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. You ever read your Bible and wonder, wow, why don't we have demons like that now? 
You know what? You know, and some people say, "Well, this can't be true." So therefore, we're going to say people didn't really understand how things work. This is really just depression or emotions. This isn't really demons. You know, there's no really there's no such thing as demons. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, I can promise you there are demons I have. Uh, I haven't, you know, I've come pretty close, I think, uh, seeing some in people's lives, in people's behaviors. And I can take you to other parts of the world, and you can definitely see them more clearly. We're just, you know, they don't have to manifest themselves like that here. They use other things. But the reason why you have such an outpouring of demonic activity in the New Testament, because you don't really see it in the church life once you get to the epistles. You really just see it in the Gospels. And why is that? Because when God himself was on earth, it got attention. And it brought them all out. God is here in the flesh. He is, he's taking on this flesh, and the Messiah, the Son of God, is here. He is living among us. And, man, when that happened, all the demons came out. Jesus shook them up and brought attention. But he is the Son of God. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The the Jehovah Witness in their translation of their Bible says the Word was what? A God. No. (laughs) Uh, You know, 99% or 95% or even 90% or whatever is still wrong, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. And, of course, if you're reading the Gospel of John and you're saying, well, who is this word? And, of course, John's going to tell him, Jesus, Messiah, the Son of God. And this one who comes is going to be overshadowed. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you, Mary, Again, that's Old Testament language, and uh, some of you may know this term, Shekinah glory, right? It's an Old Testament word for the presence of God. Remember the Old Testament where God in the tabernacle would, would just fall down in his people and the presence of God would be heavy? I mean, what happened if the Holy Spirit just fell right now? I and mean, we'd know it, I promise you. Uh, they would be weeping. They would be a burden. There would be overwhelming sense of the presence of God. There'd be joy in this room. There may be confession. And, and, and God is, is telling Mary through this angel that, man, uh, this is going to be such a supernatural event that the, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you like God did in the Old Testament. It's the same word that was also used for protecting God's people. Psalm 91.4, he will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. You know what gives us ability to claim that is true? The Holy Spirit. You can be in any situation and read that verse and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can claim it as done deal through the Holy Spirit. In regards to the situation you're in, you'll be lifted up in your spirit because you'll know it's true. And you'll you'll sense the presence of God protecting you and covering you. And so we see here the promise of Scripture, the, the, the promise back in the Old Testament of this earthly tabernacle, right? Foreshadowing a living tabernacle. That's kind of what it means there when... Uh, in John 1.14, the word became flesh and took up resident. That word resident means to tabernacle among us, to pitch a tent. We see in John 20, verse 31, but these things were written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. If I'm presenting the gospel to somebody, I'm not telling them, hey, uh, come and ask Jesus into your heart so you can be saved and go to heaven. I'm not asking people to do that. I'm asking people, come and repent. Come and and turn away from your sins and place your faith and trust in, in Jesus so that you may have life. 
abundant life, full life, a meaningful life, that regardless of where you find yourself, you have meaning and purpose because Jesus lives within you. Your sins have been forgiven. I mean, what was the headline that you read this week that the world thinks is funny and entertaining and and they see hope in it, but you see it as ridiculous and pointless? I mean, I think about sometimes things I read, it's like, well, that doesn't make me excited. I mean, so what? Who cares? Here today and gone tomorrow, right? But not Jesus. Because we have observed his glory. The glory is the only one, the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. How do you deal with things in life when it's hard? It's grace and truth. Uh, Gracia Burnham, the, you know, the one I was talking about, she said, like, you know, before this captivity, man, I was such a perfectionist. I was a, you know, a perfectionist homeschool mom. And, you know, everything had to be just right. The kids had to look just right. You can't wear pants like this. You can't listen. Everything had to be just right. But, man, let a year in captivity by terrorists, it will change your life. It will change how you see life. Because you're stripped of everything, and the only one that you can totally depend on is Jesus, full of grace and truth. And I came away from that circumstance. Jesus changed my life. And things I used to think were not, uh, things I used to think were important and mattered, it didn't matter anymore. Because Jesus had changed my life. Do you know this kind of glory? Because this is the kind of glory God gives. Glory that comes down and changes everything about us. A glory that comes down and changes your thought life. It changes your tongue pattern. It changes your, it changes your ability to live, to think, to breathe. You know who knew this type of glory? Let's look. And consider your uh, relative Elizabeth, even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is a sixth month for her who was called childless, because God is giving Mary somebody to encourage Mary. She needs somebody to encourage her, and this supernatural work of God in a uh, lady who has some age on her, you know that this is impossible, and yeah, this is impossible, but uh, you know, what's going on in Mary's life is impossible, and she's getting ridiculed, and people don't understand, and I need to be encouraged, therefore God's going to give her Elizabeth. Why? Because verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary finally tells us to live the impossible, verses 37 and 38. Live the impossible. And why can we live the impossible? Because nothing is impossible with God. God is bigger than our economy. He's bigger than our health. He's bigger than our situations, our circumstances. I mean, I, I, I'm amazed at myself sometimes at how I get bent out of shape for the stupidest things. You know, like, why is this bothering me? This is no big deal. God's the God of impossible. And I'm not talking about some magic charm or some kind of faith you believe in that's not true. It's like this, you know, if you just have enough faith, you can, you can uh, what is it uh, they say, um, you know, you can pray it into existence. I mean, that's ridiculous. I can't do anything. I can't even have a good night's sleep by myself, you know. How, you gonna have a good night's sleep? Well, you know, I hope so. You know, it's, like, a lot of things that go wrong with me. Not uh, lots of things can happen, but I know with God, because of my relationship with God, I know that nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary knew that. And how did Mary know that? How do we know that Mary really knew it? Right? How did how do we know that this really changed Mary's life? Because how she ends, I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. Mary's like, listen, I'm still nobody. <laughs> I can't believe, you know, I, Mary didn't all of a sudden say, yeah, man, of course God chose me. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be number four, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Mary. And In fact, you see the church 
falsely trying to worship Mary that way, right? Giving her some divinity where the Bible never gives Mary any divinity. She's just a slave, a, a servant. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. I am the Lord's slave who doesn't deserve this, who, who can't wrap her mind around it, and I just want to love God and follow him to the very end, even when he is, even when my precious son is dying on that cross, and I still don't understand everything about it. And God's like, well, I'm still doing the impossible, and I still know exactly, Mary, who you are and what you're going through. That's why from the cross, I'm going to tell people to take care of you. And Mary, don't worry about it, because in about three days, I'm going to see you, and I'm going to be even more spectacular than you witnessed me before. I'm going to be the resurrected Christ, and I'm not going to be bound by the flesh. I'm going to be the resurrected Christ in full appearance. So the challenge to us is to receive the great news, to receive it, to be changed by it, and to be able to say with Mary, I want to live the impossible. And it's not about having a big ministry or, you know, it's not about those things that we think are important. It's about, God, I just want to be found faithful. I just want to walk, God, I'm able to know you, so I just want to be, I just want to walk with you. I just want to be your servant. And here with Mary's confession, we get to see the the perfect picture of faith in the Bible. And this is what we all have access to in Jesus. Jesus is, Mary is saying, I am totally surrendered to the Father's will. Are you totally surrendered to God? Are you, and again, you don't just do this once and done. You do this on a regular basis. Are you totally surrendered to God? Is God in some kind of compartment? Are you totally surrendered to God? Are you able to really say with Mary, with with all these questions unanswered, God, may your will be done? Are you really able to say, God, may it be done according to your word? And the only way that we can say that is putting ourselves in the place where we're able to receive God's word, right? And it takes a certain heart to humble themselves and to feed on the living word and to receive it, to be changed by it, to be empowered by it. Mary was able to do it because she knew the living word. And if you know Jesus, you're able to do it because you have the Holy Spirit within you. The same Holy Spirit that came and united this flesh into the Son of God is able to give you life and life everlasting, to to, to give us the ability to say, like Mary, may your will be done in our lives. God, I just want to know you and follow you, and God, I want to be... I want to have that burden for lost people. I don't want to walk around with this chip on my shoulder or this self-righteous attitude or, or an attitude of grumbling or complaining, whatever f- fleshly thing that attaches itself to us, right? And we've got to be able to come like Mary and say, Father, I am your humble slave. Do your will according to your word. And I pray that as you are preparing this time during the season that you're allowing yourself to just shed some things in your life to refocus you, to to do what God wants us to do as, as individuals and as a church. God just continues to give us wisdom and direction and vision and empowerment to go out and make disciples and and have these relationships. Because you never know what God's going to do through you. You never know what God's going to, how he's going to use you. You never know how God's going to use his word through you as the Holy Spirit works through you. As we stand to sing. During this time of invitation, 
What is God saying? I ask you to respond. Oh, Father, what a blessing it is to be able to speak the name of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit. And, Father, if you don't show up, it doesn't happen. Oh, Father, we thank you for your grace. As you favored Mary, Father, your grace is still available, is still active. And I know that you will do a work in our lives this week because we are surrendered to the name above every name. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do in our lives as we daily surrender to you. Oh, Jesus, may we not tire from the burden to pray for one another. May we not tire from lifting each other up to encourage, to exhort, to cry out for salvation, to cry out for empowerment. May we never tire because that's the calling of the church. We're not going to be satisfied with anybody's lives if, it's not, if we're not seeing evidence of transformation. We can't be satisfied in our own lives. We can't be satisfied in our neighbor's lives unless we see evidence of transformation. Because as believers, as children of God, that's who we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to uh, make one correction in the bulletin because I forgot to give Tina the uh, update. Uh, 
so next Sunday we're going to meet as a uh, entire Sunday school class in the fellowship hall. So we'll all meet together in the fellowship hall, and we're going to start at uh, 9:30 because we'll have a little fellowship time, and then the program will start with our typical Sunday school hour at 10. I'm asking you to bring some uh, breakfast items uh, that we can share together. This will be an opportunity for us to fellowship uh, as one body uh, there, and then uh, James George is going to be speaking to us, uh, who is part of that ministry that we had last year, uh, Samna, and so he's going to be speaking to us about uh, that ministry and uh, to encourage us uh, in our relationship with Christ and what God is doing uh, in the world. So that will start in the fellowship hall next Sunday at 9.30. Bring some breakfast items, uh, and then we'll be finished with that by about 10.40 to give you a little break before we come back in here for regular service at 10 a.m. So he will only be with us during Sunday school. That's why we're meeting uh, combined together, and he'll depart and go to another church for the worship hour, and we'll uh, be together here in our worship hour. Also, um, if you're bringing items for the goodie boxes for our college students, that's been extended, so you can bring those items next Sunday, and we will get a package in the mail to those uh, folks in college. On Wednesday nights, it's going to be a little different. Pastor Bruce is going to be doing Advent lessons. Uh, instead, of, we're going to take a break from what he's normally doing. The kids and youth and I will be like normal. Um, next Sunday starts our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal this year is three thousand dollars, and that may seem like a lot, but last year we did twenty-eight seventy. So we're just upping it a tiny bit um, to see if we can meet that goal for international missions. And one quick thing, and I'll let you go. Um, I want to thank everybody. There's just no way I could put this in the bulletin and get it out. Um, thank you for the calls and the cards and the texts um, that I received over the last couple of weeks. Uh, if you don't know. Monday a week ago, my mother had some crazy, crazy um, episode. It turned out it was to do with ulcers, and she had gotten septic, and nobody knew, and that purged itself from her little body. And she died at the hospital, but they were able to bring her back. And I got to speak with her just for a few minutes, and they put her on a ventilator and just to give her body a chance to rest, but they really didn't have much hope for her. But let me tell you how God worked in that. On that particular day, my sisters work in the school system, and it's hard to get off just like this, get off from work, even to arrange a sub or whatever. But God had already worked it out that all three of us had doctor's appointments Monday afternoon. So we all came to the hospital, and we all got to sit with her for a week. And she wasn't very responsive. Um, she just, it, she, it just, it just took her life, but they took her off of the ventilator on Saturday, and her vital signs, girlfriend showed out, because her vital signs were great during the first couple of days, and everybody was just amazed, well, she's going to pull through, this is going to be great, and it was, it was a very sweet time, my sisters and myself and the Bee Gees, because um, my mother loved music, and she loved the Bee Gees, she thought they were girls. So we were saying, Mama, we're playing Staying Alive. I mean, our family just jokes a lot. But we went through her whole plethora of music from Jim Croce to John Denver to Skeeter Davis to the Dave Clark Five to ABBA. I mean, it was crazy. It was a two-day music fest. And when we started playing some of the songs, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, I just have to say, because I got in trouble over that song in the fourth grade, but I won't tell you how. But I'm not kidding you. She looked at me and went, so we knew that she knew we were there, and then on Monday morning, she, we knew that she was ready to give that fight up, and she waited till we all got to the hospital, and they were going to switch to comfort care and really didn't have time. She just let go very quickly. So th what I want to say is the whole time I was there, every so often I'd get a text or a message or somebody would do something so sweet or somebody would send this and my sisters are Christians but they don't really go to church and they're like who keeps texting you and I said my church who's texting you <laughs> and they were like they must love you and I said they do but they love Jesus and it, it was my sister by the end of it was my older sister was like you know Tina I've heard you say this but I can see how God worked so much out so that we could have this last week with her because we shouldn't have been able to but it was a holiday week we had her funeral friday because everybody was already out of school uh, we went down to shelby just my sisters and our kids and had a very private personal little time of memory and it was beautiful it was the most horrible thing i've seen but it was the most 
beautiful day and the most beautiful week. So God was there. He was showing off. Y'all were showing off through him. And there's just no way I can thank you enough for how you ministered to me and my sisters. They were blown away. Your pastor, let me tell you what he did. The first, When Mama got sick, she left a big mess in her room. And so people had to go clean. They'd never seen anything like that. He goes and gets them all a free oil change coupon and takes it to the people who cleaned up. Now, how's that for sweet? I mean, my sisters were like, what? I said, yeah, that's how Bruce rolls. Just hang on. If you need anything, just whisper it, and he'll do it. He'll do it. But thank you so very much for making what should have been so horrible so very bearable, and, and we appreciate it so much. I had great parents, and I didn't get to keep them as long as I wanted to, but they were wonderful parents. So thank you. Have a good week.